Well, good morning. I, um, I was thinking about this on the ride over. This is uh, it's an honor for me to be here. It really is. And um, it's kind of an unusual for me. I've, 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 I've spoken over the years to a lot of, in a lot of different venues, but never to a presbytery, uh, one that I think so highly of. Um, in fact, we have several people that work with us who are part of this presbytery, and um, it's, uh, it really is an honor for me to be here. And, and the book uh, that I wrote about humility is something that I, I share with large groups of men. I just recently got back from Atlanta sharing with a group. And I just find that it really resonates and speaks to us. Um, it, it's an issue that uh, I tell uh, people all the time, particularly when I'm speaking to a men's group. I can't think of a more important message to share to a man about living the Christian life. And I believe it's one of the great paradoxes of life. And where I'd like to start this morning um, is in the book of Daniel. I know all of you are familiar with, uh, with Daniel, um, the story, the, uh, the circumstances, and <clears throat> After being deported to Babylon, you know, he finds favor with the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. And he is about to interpret this dream. And so in, in uh, Daniel chapter 4, uh, verses 10 through 18, Nebuchadnezzar shares this dream, this very troubling dream, to Daniel. And the, and the dream is about this magnificent tree with beautiful foliage. And then this angelic figure comes and chops the tree down cuts off all its branches. And starting in verse 24, Daniel explains to Nebuchadnezzar that he is the tree. He says, This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my lord the king, that ye be driven away from mankind, and your dwelling place be with the beasts of the field, and you be given grass to eat like cattle, and be drenched with the dew of heaven. And seven periods of time will pass over you until you, this is, I think, a crucial word, until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind, and He bestows it on whomever He wishes. And that word recognize, the NIV uses the word acknowledge, but it's the Hebrew word yetta, which means to understand. Until you understand that God is the ruler over the realm of mankind and he bestows it on whomever you want, on whomever he wants. And what he's really telling Nebuchadnezzar, you don't get this. And if you keep going, what happens 12 months later? In verse 28, it says, 29, it says, 12 months later, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. The king reflected and said, Is this not Babylon the Great, which I myself have built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty? I mean, this is a picture of arrogance. And most commentators believe that he was up on this roof overlooking Babylon And he was reflecting, and he was thinking, and he was really kind of talking to himself. And I believe this is where pride and arrogance really begins. We we think to ourselves. Um, I was reminded of this in in the Magnificat, in Luke 151, when Mary says, He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. And then in Deuteronomy 8, you know, where God is getting ready to lead the Jews into the promised land. I think Moses gives some great insight into arrogance. In verse 17, when he says, If you are not humble, you will say in your heart, My power and the strength of my hand have made me this wealth. And that's what pride is. That's what arrogance is. And this is what Nebuchadnezzar was saying to himself. Now, I'm sure in in a group, 
I don't know how I want to put this, as, as well educated as you are, as well read as you are, uh, I, would, I would guess that almost all of you have read the book Mere Christianity. Um, and Lewis has it broken down into different books. And in section three or book three, it's on Christian behavior. And you first read about social morality. And then you've got sexual morality. You've got forgiveness. You've got charity. But then when he gets to pride, instead of calling it pride, what, I'm sure, what, do you, what, what does he call that chapter? The great sin. That's the way he regarded it as the great sin. And there are several reasons he believed it was the great sin. He, these, are, he's, these are his words. He says, pride has been the chief cause of misery in every nation and every family since the world began. Wow. Think about that. He says it's like a spiritual cancer that eats up your soul. And then he says, it is the anti-God state of mind. But as you read this, this section on pride, one of the things that he, he, this point that he makes very clearly, one of the reasons it is so deadly in our lives is because we are so unaware of it in ourselves. He says we can see it very clearly in the lives of others. But we have such a hard time seeing it ourselves in our own lives. This is why Tim Keller says, Pride is the carbon monoxide of sin. It silently and slowly kills you without you even knowing it. I think that, that so could easily happen to us in the ministry. Let me just read you a couple of scripture. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 12. For the Lord of hosts will have a day of reckoning against everyone who is proud and lofty, against everyone who is lifted up, that he might be abased. Proverbs 16, 5. Everyone who is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord, or surely he will not go unpunished. And then there's a phrase in the New Testament that you see in, you see it in James, you see it in 1 Peter. It says, God is opposed to to the proud. Now that word opposed is an interesting word. This was just pointed out to me. It means to go to war against. That God goes to war against the proud and the arrogant. You know, there's so many directions that I could go, uh, obviously with limited time. But I do want to spend a few minutes talking about what pride can do to us particularly men in the church. Think about how this impacts your ability to lead. And I realize we have some women here too, so it, this, this applies to everybody. First, and I see that, I, I work with businessmen primarily. And we, we've been, I've been doing this for quite a while. I was in business for 20-something years. And so I, I've been around businessmen for a long time teaching them, counseling them, befriending them. And one of the things that pride can do to a man's life, it can cause an erosion in their character. It causes us to be imposters. It so easily become guilty of duplicity. And of course, duplicity means a contradictory doubleness of thought, speech, and action. It's hiding one's true intentions by deceptive words and actions. And if you're guilty of duplicity, it means you have really no integrity because integrity means you have a unified soul. Your thoughts, your words, your deeds are all aligned. And a great example of someone who lived with true integrity was Frank Barker. And one of my real heroes. I mean, everybody talks about his humility, but behind it you see his incredible integrity. Dr. Peter Moore puts it this way about the proud. He says, coming into a room full of people, they don't see other people with needs, problems, and life experiences to learn from. What they see is an audience that's out there. People to impress, to be admired by, and from whom to gain a measure of self-esteem. 
Because of their underlying insecurity, they tend to gravitate to those who radiate celebrity, charisma, power, and influence. These are the people who must be impressed and charmed and by whom it is essential to be admired. If personal values must be bent in the process, so be it. They are totally subservient to this need. It will be expected that relationships will become manipulative and will be short-lived because self-absorption prevents them from truly being faithful despite an intent hunger for something lasting and deep. Second, pride keeps us from finding peace in life. I don't know how many of you are familiar with David Brooks. He, uh, he writes in the New York Times. Um, I read one of his books called The Road to Character. And if you re- it, it, it appears that, that Brooks is coming to Christ. I mean, he's, I'm not sure he's there yet, but he's, he's really interested. And um, he says that proud people are unstable because they attempt to establish their self-worth by winning the approval of others. He says, quote, it makes them utterly dependent on the gossipy, unstable crowd that surrounds them. And for this reason, he says, the proud person is very insecure and fearful, which of course robs you of experiencing God's peace. You see, for most people, life is all about what I do and how successful I am at what I do, which then causes people to wonder, what do you think about what I do? What do you think about my performance? How do you rate my life? And then it's only a matter of time, and this is really big in the business world. I'm not sure if it, 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 it probably is, maybe is as big in ministry as well. But it's only a matter of time before men begin to wonder, what happens to me if I fail at what I do? What would you think of me then? You see, in the business world, fear of failure may be a man's greatest fear. It's like a psychological death. Bernie Mazar said that that's what drove him to the, all the corruption, he, he, he cared so much about what people thought, and he feared failing because he watched his own father fail. Said Bernie Madoff, Bernie Madoff, who I met. You see, the more arrogant you are, the greater the fear. That's why I love to ask men two questions. How different would your life be if you had no fear of failure? And what would your life be like if you did not worry about what people think of you? It would change everything. It truly would change everything. It would transform your life, particularly experiencing real peace and contentment. Third, how does pride affect our work life? I think this is where it manifests itself in a man's life more than any other place is in his work. You see, pride impairs our ability to learn and grow because the proud think they know everything. Dr. J.P. Cotter, who is a professor at Harvard Business School, says arrogant leaders generally over-evaluate their current performance and competitive position. They listen poorly and they learn slowly. That's why after writing his book, Good to Great, Stanford professor Jim Collins wrote another book, not near as popular, but it's called How the Mighty Fail, or excuse me, How the Mighty Fall. And uh, he does all this extensive research on why these once great companies, over time, why do they fail? kind of went just the opposite direction of good to great. And he says, what ends up happening, he says, I saw no exceptions. All of these companies that were once great companies that eventually failed, they all went through five stages. 
And what is the first stage? He says, arrogance and pride. These are Collins' words. He says, they come to regard their company's success as an entitlement. And they lose sight of the true underlying factors that lead to the company's success in the first place. They do not seek to continually improve their organization and take the attitude, we will continue to keep things just the way they are and will continue to be successful because we are such a great company. And as I was reading that, I'm, I, it made me think, I'm sure it's easy to think that way about a church. Finally, and I talk about this extensively in the book, the real dark side of pride. What it's really capable of doing to a person's life. And since I'm uh, kind of limited on time, I, I'm going to skip this first one. Um, but talk about something that I think was probably more um, pertinent to your life. You may, may have seen it in yourself. You may have seen it in... Um, just in families that you know. But it has to do with raising children. Well, listen to these words from, uh, from sociologist Tony Campolo, who's a very controversial guy, but I think he's really spot on what he says here. He says, We will never know how many children have had their lives made miserable by being pushed to achievements to which makes their parents look good. Children who are driven to psychological exhaustion for academic achievement often know that their labor is primarily to enhance the status of their parents. Behind the claims that the parents expect the children to do well because success in school will increase their options is the ugly reality that the achievements of the children visibly demonstrate the superiority of the parents. Now, I wrote a blog, I write a blog every Monday. I wrote a blog about two or three years ago from an article that someone had shared with me from Atlantic Magazine. And it was titled, the, the article in the magazine was titled, The Palo Alto Suicides. Now, I, I think most of you know Palo Alto is located in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, Stanford University is, uh, is located there. There are a number of high-tech companies. Tesla was there. I think Tesla was here to move to, to, to Texas. But not surprising, it's one of the wealthiest cities in the country, and its residents are some of the most well-educated. And for this reason, and this is the reason the article was written, it was so perplexing that in the two high-achieving high schools in Palo Alto, the 10-year suicide rate among students was four or five times higher than any high school in America. And most of them are what they called cluster suicides, multiple deaths in close succession. And Sonia Luther, a psychology professor at Arizona State, is quoted in the article and shares her assessment. She says, it's not uncommon for children in affluent families to experience a high rate of anxiety and depression. They feel a great deal of, of pressure to excel at multiple academic and extracurricular pursuits. They see themselves as catastrophically flawed if they don't meet the highest standards of success. And so where does all this pressure come from? Well, according to the article, it comes from the parents. Why? The pride of life. You see, I think a shift has taken place in our country over the last hundred years. You know, parents used to be focused on their children's character development. Today, it's all about their performance. And look at what it can do to kids as they grow up. I think Lewis might be right. Pride has been the chief cause of misery in every nation and every family since the world began. And hopefully as we reflect on this and think about this, it makes us realize how important humility really is. Author Skip Heidzik says, humility is the least natural but most important of all the virtues. Listen to what scripture says. Psalm 37, 11, but the humble will inherit the land and will delight themselves in abundant prosperity. 
Isaiah 66, 2. But to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. Proverbs 29, 23, a humble spirit obtains honor. In both James 4, 6, 1 Peter 5, 5, both verses say God gives His grace to the humble. I haven't done any real extensive research on this, but does it anywhere else in Scripture says God gives His grace to someone else? He makes it clear He gives it to the humble. I just heard a really great uh, definition of grace as it's used. I'm not talking about grace in, uh, in salvation, but it's like where it says in Hebrews, it's good for the heart to be strengthened by grace. And I, I, I heard this definition, grace is divine influence upon the heart. It's God enabling us to do that which we can't do ourselves. And God gives His grace to the humble. So hopefully, just right here, we see its significance. But if you had to divine humility, if someone asked you, what does it really mean to be humble, what would you tell them? Well, it's really, it's a form of wisdom. It's awareness that recognizes, and there's that word, recognizes. It's an awareness that recognizes who really deserves the credit and the glory for what we do. Because back in Deuteronomy 8, when Moses says arrogance is looking at your life, your abilities, your achievements, and thinking in your heart, my strengths, my abilities, my powers led to the success, that's pride. Humility recognizes all that you are and all that you have is a gift from Him. John 3, 27, a man can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from heaven above. 1 Chronicles 29, 14, all things come from you is what David says to God. James 1, 16 and 17, Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good and perfect gift comes from heaven above. And then the one that I really love, what I really love is when Jesus is before Pilate. And Pilate's, you know, finally, he, Jesus isn't saying much, and finally Pilate gets frustrated and says, don't you, don't you realize who I am? Don't you realize I have the authority to, to either set you free or put you to death? And without blinking, Jesus said, if you remember, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from heaven above. And of course, this is reflected in the doxology that I think we also love. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. But the question is, how does a person become humble? Or let me put it another way, depending on where you are, how do I become more humble than I am right now? Is there any more important issue when you really think about your Christian life? You see, you just can't flip a switch and say, I'm going to start being humble tomorrow. And a great truth that I have learned is this, we, we are responsible for seeking humility. We're responsible for cultivating a humble heart. You see, humility is a choice that we must first make and then pursue. And so I would ask you this morning, are you pursuing humility? Are you pursuing a truly humble life? Now, I want to share with you three thoughts on this. And then I'll wrap this up. I'll take a few questions. You know, when I speak to this group, often when I speak to a group of men, they don't have a real knowledge of the Scriptures, and I realize that you guys do. Um, but in both the Old and New Testaments, there's a phrase that's used a lot. And I've thought about this a lot recently. And the phrase is, humble yourself. Humble yourself. If my people are called by their names, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I'll hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sins. I'll heal their land. Matthew 18, 4, whoever, Jesus himself says, whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Three times it's recorded, recorded in the Gospels. Whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. 
James 4.10, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and He will exalt you. 1 Peter 5, 6, therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you at the proper time. Now, I, 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 I think that we could probably say there are a number of ways that you can humble yourself. But let me share with you just a couple of thoughts. And I, I, I want to tell you this up front. This has changed my life. But I'm going to share, this has really changed my life. Going back to the 8th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, God is getting ready to lead the Israelites into the promised land. In verse 2, He reminds them of the purpose of their 40 years wandering in the desert. He said, it wasn't to make you more loving. It wasn't to make you more moral. He says, it was to humble you and to see if you would be obedient to God. And then if you keep reading in Deuteronomy 8, God says, when things are going well for you, when you've eaten and are fully satisfied and you live in beautiful houses and your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold multiply and all that you have multiplies, beware that you take me for granted and you become proud and you forget the Lord your God. And then he, he provides them what I consider a key perspective on the humble life. He says, but you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He that gives you power and ability to make wealth. You see, humility begins with recognizing who deserves the credit and glory for what we do, for what we have, for what we accomplish. And when we see that all that we are and all that we have is a gift from God, that's the foundation of, of being humble. And what it will naturally lead to is a incredibly grateful heart. Remember what Paul tells us in Colossians 2, 7, your heart should overflow with gratitude. Pride causes us to forget the Lord our God. Thanksgiving enables us to remember Him and keep Him in His proper place in our lives. Humble people are grateful people. They recognize who gets the credit for all that they do. And this is, what, this is what I've learned, this is what's had such an impact on me, is that we have to intentionally cultivate a thankful heart. It doesn't just come natural. This is why Henry Nouwen says, listen to this, these are great words, he says, gratitude has to be lived as a discipline. It has to be lived as a discipline. This is why I spend the first 10 minutes or so of my prayer time giving thanks to God. And what's happened over time, I find myself thanking Him throughout the day for things that are really maybe insignificant. But I find myself thanking Him. So the other day I was leaving the office. It was dark. I was the last one to leave. And I, thought, I said, Lord, I'm so grateful that I have this place where I work, but that you also have me a home to go home to, a wife to go home to. I've been married almost 27 years, but it just struck me that how grateful I was for my wife. Like I said, it's changed me. Now, a second way to humble yourself, and Jesus is very clear about this. All of you know this parable. It's one of my favorite parables uh, that Christ shares. Um, but just to kind of refresh your memory, it's in, uh, it's in Luke 18. It says, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes on all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus reveals here that the contrite tax collector is a picture of a person who humbles himself. And isn't it amazing how pride, the pride of self-righteousness has blinded this very religious Pharisee of his true condition. There was something terribly wrong with this man's spiritual condition 
And it says, Jesus says, he was not justified in the sight of God, but he sure thought he was. This is what pride can do. It blinds you. And I believe confession of sin among Christians is a forgotten practice. And I didn't come up with that. Over 40 years ago, I heard Curtis Tanner give a talk on the forgotten practices in the Christian life. And he shared several. This is the only one I remember, though. And I think sometimes we think, well, since I'm forgiven of my sin, I need to really be be asking God for forgiveness. Well, Jesus says you need to do it in in the Lord's Prayer. But we need to realize when we sin as believers, we are sinning against our Heavenly Father. And so when we, when we ask for His forgiveness, we can, when we uh, confess our sins, we're confessing to our Father. We're seeking fatherly forgiveness. We're seeking to get our hearts right with God. That's why before I get out of bed every morning, I, I, I confess my sins. Even those I can remember just in general like this tax collector. And it's had an impact on me. But not only I ask him, not only do I confess my sins, but I, I find that this is so valuable. It's been so valuable to me. I pray, Lord, show me my sin. Particularly, show me my pride. Because I'm reminded of in Matthew 7 where Jesus says, Why is it we notice the speck in our brother's eye? We just don't see the logs in our own. That's why I think we need to be at, show me the logs in my life. Show me my sin. Show me my pride. I find that he's very faithful to answer that prayer. And when he does, it's usually, it's not real, it's usually kind of ugly, what you, what you see in yourself. A final way we can humble ourselves is to practice what Dallas Willard called the discipline of secrecy. I don't know if you've ever noticed how we so easily get caught up and focused on impression management. You ever heard that term, impression management? We look for ways to impress others. You see this even in biblical times. In Matthew 23, 5, Jesus says about the Pharisees, they do all their deeds to be noticed by men. That's impression management. In the Sermon on the Mount, Christ says, beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. And that when you give your money or you pray or you fast, He says, do it in secret. And so now I regularly pray. Lord, help me to recognize when I want to impress someone, when I want to glorify myself. Help me to recognize it. Help me to be quiet. Help me to keep it a secret. Dallas Willard says that as Christians, we should all place our public relations department in the hands of God. And if he wants something to be known, let him get it out there. We need to keep it a secret. We need to be quiet. You know, having worked with with men for so long, and I'm going to wrap this up and then see if any of you might have any questions. Having worked with men for so many years now, I've come to realize how easy it is, even without realizing it, how we want to glorify ourselves. We want to live, we, we, or excuse me, we want our lives to be significant, and we want them to matter. And I thought this was interesting. I heard someone say that the worst thing for a human being is not to be disliked, is to be ignored, is to, to feel insignificant is to feel like your life is inconsequential. And this is why I think we yearn for glory and honor from the world that we live in. And this is why men have such instability in their hearts. And this is the problem. There's this audience out there that we're trying to please. We're trying to convince this audience that we are important and that our lives really matter. And what we don't end up, what we don't realize is that we end up 
allowing this audience to establish our identity. We allow their opinion of us to determine if we believe our lives have any significance. And you know what the heart of our problem is. We're seeking to impress the wrong audience. We're seeking to impress the wrong audience. You see, we were designed as human beings to glorify God and not ourselves. And that the audience that we should seek to please first and foremost is Jesus. I leave you with this, this little illustration that I really like. It's about Babe Ruth. And um, it's about a, in a game he was called out on strikes by this famous umpire whose name was Babe Pinelli, who had, who had real backbone and was a real tough umpire. And Ruth said, after he was called out on strikes, he turned to Pinelli and says, there's 40 people here who know that last one was a ball, you tomato head. Pinelli replied with the measured stateliness of John Marshall, maybe so, but mine is the only opinion that counts. And I love that because when it gets right down to it, whose opinion of my life counts the most? And when we get to the end of our lives, whose opinion really matters? And while I was sitting out there, I thought of this verse that I'll, I'll wrap this up with from Isaiah 61, 3. So they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planning of the Lord, that He might be glorified. And that's why we're here, guys.